Well, I'm wondering, have you caught your breath yet from last Sunday or the Sunday before or the Sunday before that? It's been challenging keeping up with Jesus, hasn't it? We uh, didn't call this series Unexpected Jesus for nothing. Every week there seems to be something in the text that's challenging, that's reorienting, that's mind-blowing. Imagine if you were one of the disciples and you woke up every morning wondering, I wonder who today is going to be healed or restored or offended. I wonder what sacred cow is going to be slaughtered or what tradition is going to be challenged or what blind spot is going to be exposed. If you're just joining us, we are tracking with the life of Jesus through the lens of one of the four narrators of his life, a guy by the name of Luke. He was a doctor. He was detailed-oriented. He was meticulous. We do want our doctors to be detailed-oriented. And we're doing this because one of the other narrators of Jesus' life, John, called Jesus the living word of God. He said Jesus is God's message in the flesh. So it seems best to listen to Jesus. And at Lakeside, as you know, if you've been tracking with us, if this is your home church, we exist. That's why we exist, to help people to discover and follow Jesus. We believe that, and we've experienced that restorative, recreative healing power of Jesus. There are people in this room, there are people online, there are people downtown who can testify to that. The healing power of Jesus in every facet of life. There are people who can witness to the fact that Jesus literally rescued them from destruction. And that's why we do what we do. And that's why you come. And that's why you give. And that's why you volunteer because we are about helping people to discover that powerful, life-changing message of the living Christ. And if you have been tracking with us, then you know or you perhaps have discovered how radical Jesus actually is. He's a nonconformist. You could even say in the best sense of the word, he's an iconoclast. You see, Jesus came to correct a distorted image of God that had crept into the Jewish faith, an image of God that was retributive and uh, vengeful and wrathful and legalistic and scorned outsiders. And Jesus corrected all of that. He gave us the perfect image of God. And he overturned social norms to a degree that we often fail to grasp because it's not our social context. He challenged who's inside and who's outside. He he confronted empty religion and practices that had become virtually meaningless. We've seen him go after some of the most sacred practices and institutions of their faith. Ritual purity, for instance. Who you could eat with. I don't know about you, but if I'm invited over for a meal, that's not even a question. I'm just gonna be there. Sabbath. That gift, that day of, that gift of a day off. It was a gift to them to be able to take a whole day off of work and it had become such a burden. It had been layered over with rules and regulations through the centuries and it had become heavy and heavily policed. And like so many good practices that start out as a means to an end, it had become an end in and of itself. And it's hard for us as Canadians to relate to this. I don't think there's anything particularly that identifies us as a people group. Maybe if you're American, it's, it's American Thanksgiving. Don't mess with Thanksgiving, or at least with Black Friday. Don't mess with Sunday football. And maybe for us, it's, you know, hockey night in Canada. Although based on last night, I don't know anymore. Maybe it's Tim Hortons. Do you remember when all the Tim Hortons were closed during the pandemic? It was just like, whoa, what do we do without Tim Hortons? But it's hard for us. We don't have anything of that magnitude in our culture that that forms our identity the way the Jews did. And so Jesus is pushing against all of these rituals and institutions that were so sacred to them, and he's just getting started. Today, we are going to see him tackle arguably the most sacred institution at the heart of the Jewish people, and that's family. Let me ask you, what is the cost of being part of your family? Have you ever considered that before? It's probably a good idea not to. 
Steve and I used to quip with our kids sometime around the dinner table how all the things we could do and all the places we could go if we hadn't birthed them into existence. Now, just, just to be clear, they were old enough to know that we were joking, but it was a fun conversation. But the cost of being part of your family probably depends on your age or your role in the family. So for five-year-old Chloe, it's a free ride. There's really not a lot of cost, except that she's got bedtime rules and she's got a capacity limit on the amount of sugar that she can consume. Whereas her friend Gabby down the street, no bedtime rules, no capacity. The cost for her of being part of her family uh, are the bedtime rules and the sugar limitations. Or 17-year-old Dylan who, you know, he kind of thinks he should get a car for his 17th birthday. After all, Chester down the street got one. The cost of being in his family is that he has to work for his car. Depending on your family dynamics, maybe the cost for you is reputation. Maybe it's respect in the community. Maybe you have to or feel like you have to apologize for your family, for your past, for your lineage. I've recently been reading a bit about uh, Hitler's nephews and great nephews and the supposed love child that he had. All of them have changed their names, naturally, and all of them are terrified of being found out. And fun fact, whether it's by accident or design, none of them have had a family. The Hitler bloodline will end with that generation. The cost of family. But cost and family aren't words that we would normally put together, are they? And yet, <laughs> let's face it, family costs. If you've got one, you know that. But I want you to hold that thought, cost and family. We're gonna circle back to that at the end. Today we're picking up at Luke chapter eight, verses 19 to 21, just three short verses. I'll be reading from the new Revised Standard Version, just one of the many English translations that we have. You can follow along in your Bibles, your Bible app, or the text will be on the screen. Luke eight, verse 19. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came to him, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. But he said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, if I polled you, how many of you live within two kilometers of your kids if they've moved out of the house? Or how many kids live within two kilometers of your parents if you've moved out of the house? For some of you, you're fortunate enough to live that close. For others of you, you're fortunate enough not to. And I'll leave it up to you to decide what category you fall into. But for us in the West, we wouldn't expect that. We wouldn't expect our kids to necessarily grow up and move on to our street or our neighborhood or live in our home. Some cultures to this day do that, but we tend, generally speaking, in the West, not to be like that. We tend to settle where the work is. Or maybe you go off to school in another city or another country and you either fall in love with the place or you fall in love with someone in that place and you settle, you settle down there. We used to tell our kids all the time, there's life outside the GTA. There's affordable real estate and clean air. Do not feel trapped in this GTA bubble. There's a whole country. Explore it. Now, they happen to all live within about half an hour of us. But we did tell them, you can go. We tend to spend more time here in the West, in our culture, with our friends, our colleagues, our bike and book club people, our dog walking friends, our therapists, than we do with our immediate family, don't we? Or our siblings. Not because necessarily there's anything wrong, it's just that's the way we do life. And maybe you're as close to your family 2,000 kilometers away as you ever wanna be. But in Jesus' world, this was scandalous. It was unheard of in the first century Middle Eastern culture. You see, the family bond was tight and it was long lasting. Children settled near their parents. They settled on the same property. They often settled in the same home. They all were part of the same family business, whether it was farming or winemaking or, or carpentry. You passed on the skills to the next generation and the generation after that. This was the culture of first century Mediterranean world. But for Israel, there was another whole layer to this. You see, they 
were the people of God. They were God's chosen people, people who were supposed to bring the understanding of, the experience of God to the rest of the world. They were supposed to show the world the good life, what life could be like when it's lived for God. They were the people called to bless the world. And so the family was the building block of the national identity. It was your moral obligation. It was expected of you that you would marry, that you would have children. Why? To propagate this family of God, this chosen people, to bless the world. So loyalty to family was the same as loyalty to the nation. Faithfulness to the family was faithfulness to God. That's how embedded this was. It was a big deal. So with that background in mind, let's have a look at our text again. It says, then Jesus' mother and his brothers came to him, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. Then, then when? A couple weeks ago, we saw Jesus in Capernaum. Capernaum was about 50 kilometers away from his hometown of Nazareth. It was about an eight to 10 hour walk. And it was there that Jesus praised the faith of an outsider to the dismay of the crowd, the insiders. And then he went to Nain, a town 19 kilometers from his hometown. It was about a a three hour walk. And it's there that Jesus demonstrated that to love God is to work for justice, to raise up the marginalized and the disenfranchised. And then Luke says he went from town to town to town. So we don't actually know where he is in this story. We just know that he's not in Nazareth. He's not in his hometown. So his mom and his brothers and possibly his sisters make this special road trip, probably a six hour trip, round trip, walking. You have to pack all your food for the day, your water. There's no Timmy's along the way. There's no highway stops. You gotta take a day off work. This was intentional. In other words, they were not dropping by on the way to somewhere. So are they curious or are they skeptical? After Jesus had raised the widow's son in Nain, the people said, oh my goodness, a great prophet is among us. God has come among his people and his fame spread throughout the area. So do they want in on his fame or do they fear for his life because of his fame? Do they miss him? Couldn't Mary just wait till he came home for Thanksgiving to see her son? Eventually he's gonna come home with the bags of laundry, right? Isn't that what sons do when they leave home? They eventually come back with the laundry. Do they want to pull rank and get to the front of the queue? Luke doesn't tell us that any of them are in need of healing or that they're ill. Do they want him to come back to Nazareth just to boost Nazareth's reputation, to boost tourism and foreign investment and business? Nazareth could really use that. Or, or is Jesus bad for the family name? You see, dishonoring your family was equivalent to betrayal. Did he think, did they think that he was dishonoring the name, their name because of his skirmishes with the religious elite? He was always in trouble with the Pharisees. He was always causing a stir. This would have been tantamount to betrayal, to dishonoring the family name, to disowning your family. Is his reputation hurting the family carpentry business? Is it hurting their relationships within the village? Mary, what's with your son? This visit is suspicious. Why is it so urgent? We don't actually know. Luke doesn't say. One of the other narrators of Jesus' life suggests that perhaps they were concerned for his state of mind. But whatever it was, all of this is plausible. We accept the Thanksgiving peace, <laughs> but the rest is probably plausible. And when he was told that his family was there, he uses it as a teaching moment. He says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Wow, that was a mic drop moment. That would have been a yikes moment for the disciples. They would have been thinking, oh no, now he's really done it. People would have been turning to each other and going, did he just say what I thought he said? Did I hear what I thought I heard? Really? Is he actually challenging the family unit, the core of our identity? 
But before we get to the explanation, I want you to sit with that for a moment. The magnitude, the impact of that statement. It's you. Parents, it's you. You've just heard your child say, well, actually, my parents are those who follow Jesus. And you'd be going, wait, 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 wait a minute right here. They aren't the ones who dragged you out of bed at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning all through the winter to scrape off the car and heat it and buy you hot chocolate and clean it up when it spilled. They aren't the ones who got up with you in the middle of the night to clean up your vomit. They didn't toilet train you. They didn't pay your school bills. What do you mean they're your parents too? And if you're brothers and sisters, you're thinking, what? All of these people are as... He considers all of them brothers and sisters. I, I, th I thought we had a special bond. I thought we held each other's secrets. Remember the time we snowboarded off the roof and mom and dad were away for the weekend? And we'd run around and we'd flush all the toilets when our sister was in the shower? And we wouldn't rat on each other? I thought we had something special between us. What do you mean? Jesus' followers are my brothers and sisters. We don't actually know if they heard him say this, but we know the audience did. And it would have been completely unfathomable for them to have heard this. He could challenge the Sabbath, maybe, based on compassion. He could cha challenge ritual purity, maybe, on the grounds of compassion. There might be precedent for that in their scriptures, but the family unit, oh no. Oh no, that's off limits. There's no way. I can't overstate the value and the sacred institution of family and lineage and name for Jesus' audience. You see, faithfulness to family was faithfulness to God. It's up there with observing the Sabbath and purity laws and circumcision. And Jesus blows that up. And if you've been in church a while, this could sting. Actually, if you have a family, this could sting. But particularly, if you have been in church a while, you've been raised in church, for the past century, there's been so much emphasis put on the family unit. Strengthening parents, strengthening you know, youth, having youth programs and kids programs and, and the family unit. And that's good. That's a good thing. And for the most part, it's all been good except that so often the emphasis is so much on the family unit, it's been at the exclusion of other Jesus followers. Those who are single for one reason or another, divorced or widowed. Those who maybe don't have a functional family. Those who are maybe distanced from their family. They don't have a natural family. You see, God wants solid families, he does places of belonging, places of safety and acceptance. But God wants it for everyone, whether you have a biological family or not. Jesus is creating a family where there are no unwanted children. Everyone belongs. And if you're a part of, if you're a Jesus follower, you're part of that family. And if you're not a Jesus follower, you can be part of that family. He's also doing something else. He's challenging the very symbols at the heart of Jewish identity. What is your identity? We just discussed earlier, we struggle to find our national identity, which probably isn't a bad thing. Tom Wright, one of the foremost New Testament uh, biblical scholars of our day has said this, Jesus cuts right through traditional structure, breaking hallowed family ties. He burns the symbol to the ground. It's pretty graphic. You see, for millennia, through thick and thin, feast or famine, obedience or disobedience, they were the people of God. They were God's chosen people. And those sacred symbols and institutions and practices identified them as such. They were the ones to bless the world. And now Jesus, this homeless, self-proclaimed rabbi from the backwoods of Nazareth comes along and he seems to be dispensing with sacred tradition and he's, he's doing the unthinkable, <laughs> the unfathomable, the scandalous. He's challenging 
the family unit and, the, and, and encouraging people to a greater family. It was scandalous then, and I really do think it's scandalous now. Who does he think he is? They must have been thinking. And unless we get the gravity and the audacity of this, we actually miss the impact, the implication of Jesus' message. It's so easy to slide back into group identity, isn't it? Not centered on Jesus. And we see it all the time. We're kind of a tribal species, preferring similarity and sameness over difference and diversity, be it social class or clubs or neighborhoods or even our churches. We tend to hang out with people who enjoy the same style of music or are homogenous in their views on doctrine or perhaps even share generational and racial biases. So let's not miss this. Jesus is challenging what true God following looks like. Who is your family? Where is your loyalty? And from what or from who do you get your identity, your sense of being family? To be clear, Jesus isn't disparaging the family. God created the family. God wants strong families. He's declaring that there's a stronger bond than the natural family or national identity, which is a very um, key message in our time in history. You see, the family of God is universal, it's global. It extends beyond national boundaries. Our identity is in Christ first and foremost, regardless of race, ethnicity, or the country we live in. Yeah. Ideally, your natural family is part of this grander family, the family of God. It's not hopefully a choice between one or the other. But make no mistake, Jesus is saying, water is thicker than blood. The water of your baptism is thicker than the blood of your family. And I really believe that's as hard for us to hear today as it was 2,000 years ago. Baptism is our birth into a new family. And here's the radical beauty of this. We will discover a family we never knew we had. And that's both the wonder and the threat of this new family because you can't choose your family and yet they're your family nonetheless. D.A. Carson, another contemporary biblical scholar, has said this. I want you to listen carefully. He said, ideally, the church is not made up of natural friends. It's actually made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together because they have all been loved by Jesus himself. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Wow. It's a radical new family with the power to transform the world. And who's in this family? Those who hear the word of God and those who do it. Imagine that Mary, Jesus' own mother, revered among the saints, canonized among Christian churches, is on the same level as you and I, as other Jesus followers. She stands equal with everyone. You see, it's not that Jesus rejects his family, it's that he enlarges it. And the name for this new family? Church. Church. And not perhaps church as you think of it, a building that you go to, where a place where we come to to sing and to hear a sermon. Maybe perhaps for you, there's a huge disconnect between church and Jesus. Maybe you've been wounded, you've been hurt. And for you, Jesus and the church aren't synonymous. The church doesn't seem to reflect Jesus in your eyes. The church that's on the news, the church that's racked with scandal and abuse and power mongering in your mind is nothing like Jesus. And you're absolutely right. It is the antithesis of Jesus, not that church. Grieved me to have to cut out a huge chunk out of this sermon, but I did. So you'll want to catch it on the bonus content this Wednesday where I dig a little deeper into church. 
But for now, just remember that Jesus is not starting a new religion. He is starting a new family, friends. A new family. So do you see what Jesus is doing? He's taking a symbol. He's taking an institution, a concept that's so embedded in their DNA, family, and he's, he's taking that and he's repurposing it to demonstrate the depth of the loyalty and the commitment that we have for one another, those who follow Jesus, those who hear his message and try to do it. As one author said, he turned tables into pulpits and homes into assembly halls. These groupings of people who are committed to following Jesus and by extension committed, committed to one another in a bond so strong, so lasting, so non-negotiable as the natural family was. It was Jesus' weapon of mass transformation, the family of Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with meeting in buildings. They can be a great asset. As long as we realize this is not church. This is one expression of church, but this is not what Jesus had in mind when he established his church, his family. Church is family in the deepest and most committed sense. Church is a buildingless people movement a buildingless people movement that sometimes meets in a building. And throughout the centuries, this concept's been lost and found and lost and found again. And one such community in the 15th century, the Anabaptists under Balthazar Hubmeyer, they, they understood this. They claimed this. They were serious about family. And this is the pledge that they recited before they shared communion every single week. If you will love your neighbor, lay down and shed your blood for him. Make peace and unity among them and reconcile yourselves with all those whom you've offended. Love your enemies. Then say, I will. Their pledge was to die for each other if need be. And it often was. And it often still is around the world today. Now, we might die for our natural family, especially our kids, but would we ever for just another Jesus follower? Physically dying is the extreme. I realize it probably won't ever happen here in Southern Ontario, thank God. But you get the idea, this profound sense of commitment and loyalty and oneness. And don't worry, we won't be saying that pledge later before we take communion. It's not a pledge I'm sure I'm at the place where I can say yet. I asked you earlier, what's the cost of family? What's the cost of your family? And do you consider it a cost when there's love? Friends, that's what we're called to as Jesus followers. This sense of family in the first century Middle East, non-negotiable, lasting, loyal, that's what it means to be church, family, those who hear and follow. And there's no avoiding it in the text. Believe me, it would have been wonderful if I could have found a workaround. There's no getting out of this. This is Jesus' family. This is what he's inviting us into. Now, every family has rituals, right? Your family has rituals. My family has rituals. Every year we celebrate our birthdays usually. We may not name, name the number, but we still like to celebrate another year of life. We often do that with cake, or in my case, icing. Cake's optional. But we, we celebrate the day that we entered life, the day that we entered this family. And you could say our baptism is our birthday into our new family. One, one of the writers in the New Testament encouraged us to remember your baptism. Remember the day you entered this new family. Remember the day of new life for you. You see, the church is not a sentimental institution. The church is a radical new family with the power to transform the world. So if we think of baptism as our birthday, we might think of the communion table as our family dinner, dinner table. 
That place where we gather to be reunited, to be stitched back together. We come back at the end of the day, we share stories. The day where we celebrate, the place where we celebrate moments and milestones, the place where we sometimes have difficult conversations. And you know what that's like when you're at odds with someone around that table. The the silence is deafening and the tension is unbearable and the food doesn't even taste good. Jesus is saying, make things right with your family. Make things right with me. As a matter of fact, making things right with your family makes things right with me. For those of you who are new to this practice, this is something that Jesus followers have been practicing for centuries. It's a ritual that Jesus himself instituted as a way to remind us of his life, his death, his resurrection, this new family that we're invited into, the cost to Jesus to establish this new family and the benefits of being part of this family, our responsibility to one another, that we are a family that loves and laughs and cries and offends and forgives and follows together. We may come to this table as strangers, but we leave as family. I'd like to invite the band up now. And as they come, I just wanna invite you to pause for a moment and ask yourself, well, sit with, the, sit with the reality first of this new family. It's staggering, it's staggering. And if you're new to this, and you didn't know that you could be part of a new family, you can, you can even bring your family along with you. There'll be prayer ministers here at the front after. If you wanna be part of this family, they would be happy to invite you into this family to pray over you, to pray with you. And for those of you who are already Jesus followers, can I ask you to ask yourself to invite the Holy Spirit to probe deep in your heart. Am I okay with my family? Is everything good between me and this family of Jesus? Is there anyone I've mistreated or offended? Is there someone I I need to make things right with? Is there anyone I'm excluding or want to exclude from this family? Ask the Holy Spirit point that out and then ask the Holy Spirit to give you the courage to make that right to hear and to do because that's the identity of this family of Jesus this family of God those who hear the message and do it friends you are loved look around you have a family a place of belonging a place of acceptance a place of safety we long to be that here we invite you to be that for others and as family we're going to gather metaphorically around this lord's table the communion table we're not going to read the pledge as i mentioned but I would like to share a poem with you. It's an appeal from Jesus to his church. This is my broken body. This cup is my spilled blood. I give my broken self to you. Take in my life. Let me nourish you with my love until the spirit of compassion bursts the old wineskins of your brittle hearts until you become a new creation. Let the body of my work become the work of your body. Embrace the outcasts, reconcile enemies, feed my people. Unite in me with me and you. I give my broken self to you. Only in coming together can the fullness of my life be manifest again. 
Let this bread bind you together. Let this wine wash away your divisions. I'm broken for a broken world. A world that needs your love to be made whole again. Take me into you and become my body. Eat this bread, drink this wine, and do this in remembrance of me. So Lord Jesus, we gather around this table today, many of us as strangers, and yet you've said we're family. May you continue to be or become our identity. That our life together is centered on you, Jesus. Thank you that you are continuing to knit us together. So I pray that today as we share this cup and this wafer together, this, this body and blood, that you would reunite and unite recreate and knit us together as one family. We ask this in the power of your name. Amen. So if you're in the room or in the chapel, just encourage you to just lift the little wafer, the film off the top of the communion cup you were given and take out the wafer. And together, let's just Eat this in remembrance of whose we are, in remembrance of Jesus. Let's eat together. And then if you take the second film off, the juice is. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. Drink this and remember me. So as a family, whether you're at home or here, let's drink together. with a challenge this morning. Is church a place you go to or a family you're committed to? Is it a place you go to or a family you're committed to? You'll want to join us next week, either in the building or online, for another episode of Unexpected Jesus, and you will not be disappointed. Mark's going to be sharing with us next week and we're going to be challenged again and reoriented again and our minds blown again. So we look forward to joining with you again next week. And now I just want to bless you as you go. May the grace of Jesus and the love of God and the kinship, that's the family making of the Holy Spirit, go with you. Have a great week, friends. We love you. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here with us online and we'll see you soon. Our prayer ministers will be up at the front if anyone would like prayer.